This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 117. Coming up on Space Time, the winds in Jupiter's Great Red Spot are speeding up, NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock completes its mission, and Dragon returns to Earth full of completed experiments from the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study based on images taken by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope show that the winds near the edge of Jupiter's Great Red Spot are accelerating. The Great Red Spot is a persistent high-pressure region in the atmosphere of Jupiter's southern hemisphere, producing the solar system's largest anticyclonic storm. Observations of the storm go back to at least 1665, suggesting that the tempest has been active for well over 350 years. The Great Red Spot is an upwelling of material from deep inside Jupiter's interior. The cloud tops of the storm are some 8 kilometres above the surrounding cloud tops. If seen side-on, the storm would have a tiered wedding cake structure, with high clouds at the centre cascading down to its outer layers. Infrared data suggests the Great Red Spot is colder than its surroundings, but that would be due to its higher altitude than most of Jupiter's other cloud tops. Yet interestingly, the upper atmosphere directly above the tempest is substantially higher in temperature than the rest of the planet. Its reddish colour is thought to be caused by chemical products created from the solar ultraviolet irradiation of ammonium hydrosulfide and the organic compound acetylene, which produces a reddish material, most likely complex organic compounds called tholines. The new findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, are based on more than a decade of detailed Hubble observations. Scientists found that the Great Red Spot's average wind speed just within the boundaries of the storm, known as a high-speed ring, has increased by up to 8% from 2009 to 2020. In contrast, winds near the Great Red Spot's innermost region are moving significantly more slowly. Astronomers reached their findings by tracking wind vector data, looking at speed and direction from hundreds of thousands of locations in the anticyclone each time Jupiter was observed by Hubble. As to what these findings could mean, well, that's hard to diagnose since Hubble can't see the bottom of the storm very well. Anything below the cloud tops is invisible in the data. But it's still an intriguing bit of data which can help scientists better understand what's fueling the Great Red Spot and how it's maintaining energy. The massive crimson-coloured clouds are spinning counterclockwise at speeds of more than 650 kilometres per hour, and the vortex is bigger than the planet Earth. But it's been steadily shrinking in size over the past 100 years or so. In fact, measurements taken back in the late 1800s show it was around 41,000 kilometres wide, big enough to fit three Earths inside it. But by 1979, NASA's twin Voyager missions flew past the gas giant, measuring the Great Red Spot at just 23,300 kilometres across. Then a Hubble image taken in 1995 measured the spot at just 21,000 kilometres wide. And by 2009, it had shrunk to just 18,000 kilometres wide. In 2012, observations revealed a noticeable increase in the rate at which the spot was shrinking by some 933 kilometres every year, and also it was changing in shape from an oval to a circle. It was also changing in colour from a deep red ochre to a pale pink, sometimes even white. The most recent measurements show that the Great Red Spot's rate of shrinkage has slowed down, but it's now just 16,100 kilometres across and decidedly orange in colour. As to what that means for its future... Well, no one really knows. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock completes its mission and the SpaceX Dragon cargo ship splashes down safely in the North Atlantic Ocean loaded with equipment and completed experiments from the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
NASA says its experimental deep space atomic clock has now completed its mission. The instrument was deployed on General Atomic's orbital testbed spacecraft, which was launched on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket as part of a US Defense Department test program. The clock's mission was to test the feasibility of using an onboard atomic clock to improve spacecraft navigation in deep space. While atomic clocks are the most stable timekeepers on the planet, they still have tiny instabilities that can cause minute lags or offsets in the clock's time versus the actual time. Left uncorrected, these offsets will add up and could lead to large errors in positioning. While fractions of a second might only mean the difference between which turnoff you take using satellite navigation, it could mean the difference between safely arriving at Mars or missing the planet altogether in a deep space mission. Atomic clocks on global positioning system navigation satellites are updated twice daily by base stations on the ground in order to keep them accurate. But having to send frequent updates from Earth to an atomic clock in deep space far beyond Earth's space would not be practical and would defeat the very purpose of equipping a spacecraft with one. So currently, spacecraft and deep space missions rely on ground-based atomic clocks. To measure a spacecraft's trajectory as it travels beyond the moon, navigators use these timekeepers to precisely track when these signals are sent and received. Because navigators know that radio signals travel at around 300,000 kilometers per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, they can use these time measurements to calculate the spacecraft's exact distance, speed and direction of travel. But the further a spacecraft is away from the Earth, the longer it takes to send and receive signals, from several minutes just beyond the Moon to more than six hours out near Pluto. And that significantly affects these calculations. However, by fitting spacecraft with an onboard atomic clock paired to the navigation system, a spaceship could instantaneously calculate where it is and where it's going. But it all depends on how accurate the atomic clock is. So, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, built an ultra-precise mercury ion atomic clock, no larger than a toaster, just 25 centimeters on each side, in order to test just how well it could keep time to the nanosecond without regular updates. After a successful year-long primary mission in Earth orbit and a mission extension, NASA found that the atomic clock it built was more than an order of magnitude better than GPS atomic clocks, with a deviation of less than 4 nanoseconds in 20 days. The data collected by this mission will now be used on the Deep Space Atomic Clock 2 project, which will travel to Venus aboard NASA's Veritas spacecraft, which launches in 2028. Like its predecessor, the Deep Space Atomic Clock 2 will be a technology demonstrator, meaning that Veritas won't depend on it in order to fulfill its goals. But this next generation will be smaller, use less power, and be designed to support a multi-year mission like Veritas. This report from NASA TV. How do we navigate through space? Currently, spacecraft flying beyond Earth don't have a GPS to find their way through space. Navigators on Earth send a signal to the spacecraft, which receives it and sends it back. Extremely precise clocks on the ground called atomic clocks measure how long it takes the signal to make this two-way journey. The amount of time tells them how far away the spacecraft is and how fast it's going. The farther out in space the spacecraft is, the longer it takes to receive and send the signal. But what if humans are sent to another planet, like Mars? A two-way system that sends a signal from Earth to a spacecraft, back to Earth, and then to the spacecraft again, would take an average of 40 minutes. Imagine if the GPS on your phone took 40 minutes to calculate your position. You might miss your turn, or be several exits down the highway before it caught up with you. If humans travel to the red planet, it would be better if the system was one way, allowing the explorers to immediately determine their current position, rather than waiting for that information to come back from Earth. NASA is testing new technology that would allow future explorers to do just that. The Deep Space Atomic Clock is the first demonstration of an atomic clock that can be used for navigation in deep space. It will allow a spacecraft to calculate its own trajectory instead of depending on Earth. If a spacecraft had one of these clocks on board, it could receive a signal from one of those big antennas on Earth and quickly measure its speed and position. The Deep Space Atomic Clock could one day let astronauts navigate safely and accurately to Mars and beyond. This technology demonstration is the first step in making one-way space navigation a reality.
This is space time. Still to come, a SpaceX Dragon cargo ship safely splashes down in the North Atlantic Ocean, loaded with equipment and completed experiments from the International Space Station, and later in the science report, Russia undertakes two new Zircon hypersonic cruise missile tests, including one from a submerged submarine. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A SpaceX Dragon cargo ship has returned safely to Earth, splashing down in the North Atlantic Ocean, loaded with equipment and completed experiments from the International Space Station. The CRS-23 capsule was quickly retrieved by SpaceX recovery teams and taken back to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission had launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station back on August the 29th. The experiments carried aboard Dragon included the ring shear drop experiment, which tested a device that uses surface tension rather than a solid container to hold liquids, something only possible in microgravity. It was used to study protein aggregates called amyloid fibrils, which may be involved in Alzheimer's disease, as well as Parkinson and type 2 diabetes. Also aboard was an experiment to inhibit muscle atrophy in microgravity and the Genes in Space 8 research experiment, which looked at how changes in the levels of liver enzymes can affect how the body metabolizes some drugs. The mission allowed a quick return to Earth of time-sensitive experiments, allowing scientists to look at samples sooner before gravity's had a chance to take its full effect. It also means that ground controls and spaceflight samples can be tested in the same lab at the Kennedy Space Center, allowing more consistent results. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study shows that losing 15% or more of your body weight could help people with type 2 diabetes. The findings reported in the Lancet Medical Journal show weight reduction could slow the progression of the disease, reduce complications, and may even reverse the disease in many cases. The authors say the study was so convincing, they believe a loss of 15% of your body weight should become a central focus in all cases of managing type 2 diabetes. The Russians have carried out two new Zircon hypersonic cruise missile tests, including one from a submerged nuclear submarine. While the Zircon has previously been launched from the air and surface, this was the first time the Mach 5 capable missile has been launched from underwater. Moscow says the sub fired the missile from a depth of 40 metres or 141 feet, successfully hitting its target 1,000 kilometres away in the Barents Sea in Russia's Arctic. The advantage of hypersonic missiles is that they're so fast, anti-missile systems don't have time to react. Also, because they're travelling so fast, they don't need to carry any explosives. Their kinetic energy at impact alone is the equivalent of four tonnes of TNT. Paleontologists on the Isle of Wight have found fossils of two new species of Spinosauroid, a group of predatory theropod dinosaurs closely related to the giant Spinosaurus. Their unusual crocodile-like skulls allowed this group of meat-eaters to expand their diets, allowing them to hunt prey both on land and in the water. Local fossil seekers found parts of two skulls, and a team from the Dinosaur Isle Museum recovered a large portion of a tail. So far, more than 50 bones have been recovered from the site known as the Wessex Formation, which dates back some 125 million years to the early Cretaceous. The new findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, suggest both dinosaurs were around 9 metres long each and belonged to species previously unknown to science. The first specimen has been named Ceratosuchops infrarodius, or the horned crocodile-faced hell heron, and features a series of low horns and bumps ornamenting the brow region. The second fossil has been named Ripper ovinator milneri, or Milner's riverbank hunter, in honour of the esteemed British paleontologist Angela Milner, who recently passed away. 
Well, in case you still needed proof that there's one born every minute, comes news of Samantha Milnes, who claims to be a pet psychic. That's right, for the right amount of money, the 50-year-old animal communicator and part-time pet detective who lives with a partner Greg, a professional cat sitter, will tell your pet's fortune. Tim Menham from Australian Skeptic says she predicts a good year for guinea pigs and budgies, but a bad year for Staffordshire Terriers and Goldfish. Sometimes you just come across stories that are silly. Um, I don't know how you, how you qualify to be a pet psychic or an animal communicator, as, as she got. She had to do a vision quest or spiritual retreat. So she, she'd done that, and therefore she qualifies as an animal communicator and pet detective. Ah, so she has an animal guide who takes her through life. She probably does. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it's her cat, who's 16 years old. She has made predictions for the well-being of various animal breeds. So she's, she, she's a Brit, so presumably these apply to predictions in uh, the UK. But uh, it's, it's going to be a great year for budgies. Guinea pigs are going to do well. Certain breeds of dog are doing okay, but uh, staffies, uh, staffy bull terriers are going to have a struggle and pooches will need a lot of reassurance in the coming year. The ones that are really going to do poorly are, I'm afraid, um, goldfish. Uh, you must say they're dead in the water. Oh, uh, yuck, 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 yuck. As, as I look she, at my goldfish now, now that you you said that. No, it's okay because it's not going to happen until December. Okay. That uh, it's December, mate. It's, it's, uh, the, the, a lot of goldfish are going to die in December, and she reckons it's because of some kind of fungal infection. Now, I'm not quite sure how you spread fungal infections in goldfish. Um, at By not of, cleaning uh, the tank and changing the water. But regularly. everybody, mm. everybody at the same time, and a lot of Staffordshire bull terriers are going to be abandoned in January. So I don't know. Are these presents well, people get actually, for Christmas? Well, that's actually yeah, that happens. Unfortunately, pets are uh, here. Humans are evil people sometimes, and they consider pets to be uh, disposable things, which they're not. Yeah. That's why you don't see many Afghans around anymore. I mean, Afghan uh, dogs around any uh, much anymore. They, they were fashionable at one stage, and now they're very unfashionable because they're too big. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how you pick one particular month for one particular breed, though. Yes, people do sort of get a, get a dog for Christmas, and then by January they're sick of it, and they dump it on the RSPCA or whatever. I would suggest that if you're going to put your money on anybody, don't put your money on the pet psychic. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 